Welcome everyone to our first edition of the series, Addressing Concerns of Today to Build an Inclusive Cranberry Area Tomorrow. The Cranberry Area Diversity Network developed this video series to raise awareness of experiences of some of our residents. Today we are focusing on amplifying Black voices in Cranberry. The Cranberry Area Diversity Network, or CADN, was officially formed in 2012 by Gary Winterhalder, who is no longer with us, and me, in response to incidences concerning minority residents in Cranberry. My family and I moved to Cranberry Township officially in 1974 and bought a home and began our lives here. Almost immediately after we moved into our house, we had crosses burned on our lawn and a visit from the Ku Klux Klan. My son was riding his bike in the neighborhood and the police stopped him because he was an African-American youth in an all-white neighborhood. I was driving home from work and the police stopped me because I was an African-American man in this all-white neighborhood and they had not seen me there before. On the other hand, my wife was the first African-American person who became a teacher at the Southwest Butler School District which is now the Seneca Valley School District. My wife, Grace, often told her parents of her children, of her kids that she taught, that they should teach their children to work with everyone, no matter the color of their skin. And it seemed to work out for her in her classes. Hello, my name is LeVar Stephen Towling, and I'm a school counselor at Ryan Glur Middle School. My journey to become a school counselor at Seneca Valley was filled with many challenges that I had to work hard to overcome. I had never had a career plan that would lead me to my dream job of becoming a school counselor, or even seen anyone who looked like me in the position. In graduate school, I was given a list of schools to complete an internship at that was within commuter distance of Slippery Rock. My biggest fear was that I wouldn't be accepted by the school or welcomed by the community because of the color of my skin. This made finding an internship I was comfortable with a little bit more difficult. In my search, I was comforted by the size and diversity of the student population at Seneca Valley, shown through images on their website for school-wide events, such as musical performances, athletic competitions, and school-wide events, such as Cultural Day. And in a fortunate turn of events, I ended up interning at Hain Elementary under Roseanne Lamberto. From the minute I met Roseanne, I felt like Seneca Valley was my home. I felt like I belonged here like I was a part of this community. I still remember Roseanne sharing with me the story of a student I worked with, telling her he's black, just like me. And in my first year as a school counselor at Hain, receiving the most thoughtful card from a parent who was overjoyed by knowing that her son had an opportunity to work with someone whose skin tone matched his own. Being an African-American working in education comes with many challenges. Some challenges come overtly from the voices that don't wanna see you there. But the toughest for me come internally from the voices that heard too many times that I'm not welcome here. I overcome each of these obstacles by reminding myself that each interaction I have with a student or parent is a step in the right direction for our community. I want every student to know, no matter what they look like or where they come from, once they enter one of our schools at Seneca Valley, they belong here. I know there is still a lot of work to be done to make that statement ring true for every student, but we are committed to reflecting on the experiences of our students and making Seneca Valley a welcoming place for everyone. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you around the community soon. I grew up in a very diverse area of Charleston, South Carolina. When I moved here at age 10, I genuinely did not understand the concept of race, but to walk into a school where only two of the other kids looked like me was a huge culture shock. Back in my hometown, I didn't realize that I was a minority and I wasn't raised in an environment where the minority stuck out either. I was a kid and I saw other kids despite their skin color. Majority of us were brown, but we weren't aware there was a problem with our skin being such. But when I moved here, I realized that my skin was the problem. 
I remember how the teachers treated me, how my classmates looked at me and determined that I was inferior, how uncomfortable I was wearing my kinky hair until I damaged it under the straightener every morning. Black children are required to mature faster than their white classmates because of this. We are groomed in a way to accept racism from our community head on, while white children are allowed to be blissfully ignorant and enjoy their childhood. Going to school my senior year, I couldn't go one day without someone commenting about my race, making a remark on how strong I must be being a black woman who goes to a predominantly white school, touching my hair, or mixing me up with four other black girls in my grade. Now in college, having a friend group with mainly black girls and other minorities, I realized what a bubble this town combined me and other black kids to. But what's even scarier to me is the white people who don't leave this town, don't have any black friends, or know any black people, period. There are still times that I'm back here visiting my family, or on break that I'm alone at the gym, shopping, or even pumping gas, and I'm looking for one other black person around me so I know that I am safe and comfortable. However, I'm kind of grateful that I moved here so I know how to spot disguised racism, upfront racism, the performative activist, and being able to gain a sense of my place in this world as a young black woman. Hi, my name is Bryce Benjamin. I'm at Olnaya Seneca Valley School District. I graduated in 2015, and my experience at Seneca Valley was definitely a mixed bag, I'd say. Uh, positives were the great education, uh, sports life, I never would have gotten at another school, I feel like, and you know, after school programs like clubs or after school transportation back home were all very good to me. Um, but negatives, for sure, being only one of the few black people in the whole probably white school district was, it, it was, it was tough. On definitely on many occasions, even from third grade and on, I had many racist jokes against me. And then when I got called nigger to my face, if I retaliated physically or harshly or verbally, I was always reprimanded and not actually supported. So I never felt like I had true like support on my side to combat that racism. And, It's, it sounds bad, but it's exhausting being black in America. It's, <laughs> it's so exhausting. <laughs> it's so exhausting because you have this added pressure on you when you're public, like a target on your back to always look better, always talk better, always succeed better, just to be on an even playing field. Because if you don't, people think you're just a diversity token or you're just um, not like smart enough to be in the position you're at. Like for example, people watch this video, they see me wearing this hoodie, they might think I'm not educated or not qualified to talk like this, but I am. I go to grad school at Carnegie Mellon University for cybersecurity, and I've had a whole life of pure science and me and education that I'm definitely qualified to do a lot of stuff. Even my career in offices, I'm still treated as the, I think, diversity token, and people don't really think that I belong. My experience is definitely gave me more experience of being sympathetic towards other people and maybe forced me to realize that if I'm being treated this way, I'm sure there's other people, other cultures being treated the same way as I am. I lived in Cranberry for 20 years, to say the least. And I would say my experiences as a student at Seneca Valley and in Cranberry Township were positive for the most part. I did not deal with racism to an extreme extent, but I was reminded of the color of my own skin, whether I was on the bus, in the hallways, you know, it, pretty much every area where some of my peers would throw a, a black joke in every once in a while. And, or if I did something as far as athletics, uh, because that's what I did the most, football, basketball, and track, I was reminded that my athletic skill came because of the color of my own skin and not just from my own unique God-given ability. And over time, I just learned to shrug it off. I did not necessarily go and seek out any help from any of the teachers or administration or any adults because most of them, if not all of them, were also white. And I don't think they would have been able to identify with how those comments made me feel and I don't think anything would have been done at the end of the day. I know that there are other students, uh, some that I graduated with and went to school with and 
some who were before me and after me that have dealt with the same thing. And we can all believe that in a non-racist society, what's most important is identifying with each other. We may not understand completely what one individual may be going through within a different culture, but it's okay to at least acknowledge and acknowledge that they have this problem and address it accordingly to make sure that it does not persist or continue any further. And that goes for Seneca Valley School District and Cranberry Township, the community as a whole. Hi, when I was looking for a teaching job, a friend told me Seneca Valley was hiring. I had no idea where Seneca was, so I did some research. I decided to go to the interview. I knew there might only be a few black teachers in the district, but I said to myself, as long as my skin is brown, nothing is going to be different for me. It can be a very lonely journey when you don't see anyone that looks like you. What I wasn't prepared for was being the only black teacher in the district for many years. Well, two decades later, I'm still teaching in the district. And let's just say there still aren't a lot of black teachers that teach there. I have worked with some good people throughout the years, but I will say there were times when someone would say racially negative things when I thought to myself, did you forget I'm in the room and that I'm black? You have to be very careful what you say, especially with the students. They have to be able to depend on us. Each year, I would pray that parents would look in the yearbook before Meet the Teacher Night so they would see that I'm black because there have been times when some parents didn't want me teaching their kids because of the color of my skin. I would like to say to the parents who kept their children in my classroom, respected me, supported me throughout the years, and had kind words to say, I thank you. And also to the parents who are giving their children a foundation and teaching them people are people no matter what the color is, I thank you. Racism is real and hatred is real. Look at a person's heart and their character. Get to know other races. Reach out to people that you know who are serious in making a difference. Finally, I realize I am where I'm supposed to be. In many cases, I might be the only black teacher your children might see. And for the minority children, they need to see someone of color because the journey for them can be just as lonely. I'm biracial, my mother is white, and my father is black, and I grew up around both families where we mixed. I was born in California, raised in Arizona, um, and thanks to my husband's military career and a little bit of my time in the military as well, we've moved five times in 15 years to include living overseas. Um, and in that time span, nowhere have we felt so isolated based on our race than living here in Cranberry people that we had considered friends and allies and you know we shared you know just how uncomfortable we felt here and in one of those conversations um, this person said well I'm not going to apologize for my whiteness and that really hurt me um, and this person was raised in this area um, and spoke very highly of this area um, before us moving here so it really hurt me for a few reasons one is because I'm not asking anybody to apologize for their whiteness, um, especially being biracial. My mother <laughs> is white, um, who she met. So that just really just made prove to me that you do see color um, despite what you say. What she didn't hear was that I feel very uncomfortable here and there was no sympathy, there was no compassion for that. And really I think when if tables were turned and this person was in an environment where she was every day in, going to work, taking your kids to school, going to the grocery store, moving around 24 seven, being the minority and just really feeling out of the box, going to church here, um, that they would feel the same way. You say you value diversity and inclusion. Why do our schools look the way they do? Why do our churches up here look the way they do? Why do our work environments look, look the way that they do? Why is there not diversity? And let's face it, interracial um, relationships are hard. I grew up in a, um, in a family that had those dynamics, um, but I've learned that it's worth it. Um, meeting somebody that doesn't look like you or is from a different area or has a different background or has a slew of different experiences, um, it could be challenging. And it, But if you're up for it and you go through those hard times, I am confident that life is more rewarding that way. Me, as an individual that's currently serving, it definitely, you know, made me feel uncomfortable 
to serve and, and be in different places where, you know, I'm putting my life on the line to come and live in the area of a community where I feel like 100% I am not welcomed, nor are my children. Um, so that posed an extremely hard challenge for us here and made me think on, man, what are we gonna do? Because this is where uh, our career has brought us. Um, and at the end of the day, my defense was to wake up every day expecting discrimination. Um, I pretty much buckled up and, and got ready for each and every day, assuming that one way, form, or fashion, I was gonna have to face discrimination in this environment, in this area, which doesn't make it feel like a community. Um, so someone would say, you know, well, why be here? Well, why move here? Well, why live in an environment like that? And my answer to you would be, number one, again, I am, you know, currently doing what is required of me because of my job and because of my position. So I have to be here, number one. Number two, um, as my wife would always say, you know, even though we face these different things, you know, I don't believe that everyone is like that. I don't want to believe that everyone out here has a problem with people of color. So, you know, the motivation is, like she says all the time, is to be a part of the solution instead of being a part of the problem. Uh, when I think about um, the community here, um, it is one that does lack diversity. Um, it's been quiet, it's been calm, it's been safe. Uh, but it would be good to see others that look like me and it would make it a more welcoming uh, community. When it comes to my daughter's experience, she absolutely loves it, but um, it's something that she did come to us this year and uh, ask us, my wife and I, uh, is our black people allowed to be teachers? And, you know, confused, we, yeah, absolutely, sweetheart, but it didn't dawn on us that she has never seen a black teacher. And that's something that uh, really resonated with my wife and I, and it's something that uh, to this day we have discussions about whether or not uh, this township will be our forever home. And right now that answer is no. And part of that is because of the lack of diversity uh, for my family and I. So what is wrong with saying I don't see color or teaching my children not to? It's not a cute phrase to say or, or use when talking about race, uh, unless you physically can't see color. Um, I think it's a missed opportunity to actually say I don't treat people differently because of the color of their skin. Like, that's a more impactful statement than saying something cutesy like, I don't see color. You see color. <laughs> you, you absolutely see color. You see the difference between my skin and a white person's skin. And you see the difference between uh, my hair or my daughter's hair and, and a white person's hair. There's differences that we have. To acknowledge those differences is something that's a good thing. You don't have to not acknowledge them or, or stray away from that conversation. We're different. There's nothing wrong with being different. And it's okay to point those out and discuss them. Uh, no one's going to be hurt by discussing them unless you're being disrespectful or degrading them. You can be powerful with your voice and, and have courage to uh, speak up and say, this is not right, don't do that. So, and, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to teach our daughter right now is to be strong and use your voice and be confident um, in things that you know are absolutely wrong. If someone's teasing someone or, or doing something wrong, tell them, hey, hey, you shouldn't do that. You know, and it's, it's okay to do that. You've already heard talks by people who have overcome hurdles and obstacles to live a fuller and more abundant life. Being white doesn't necessarily mean that you have it easy or you don't have to work hard or that you don't have mountains to climb. I personally know white people who have overcome dysfunctional families, poverty, addictions, and various things in their lives and struggles that have been quite difficult. That is not my story though. I'm not only white, but I was born in an upper middle class family in the United States with two parents who loved me. My father was college educated as an engineer. My mother, however, was racist. My mother's overt racism was always a source of embarrassment for my sister and I. How many black parents have to explain to their children about racist actions or speech? We loved the two girls we adopted as we did our own birth children, but my mother did not accept them and was resentful of the entire adoption. We had to explain this unfortunate experience to them at a very young age. What I never thought about was the fortunate conditions that I was born into that allowed me and my partners to flourish. 
We had been born into class, wealth, educated family. And being of the white race gave me a greater opportunity to become successful materially. So how do I handle this good fortune in a thankful way? How do I combat both racism and also help those who do not have the advantages that I had? Confronting my own blindness is the first step. At this crucial stage in our history, I would like to be a part of the solution. So the next step is to ask my black friends how to help me to help them. Hopefully we are working for a day when privilege that is reserved for only the few will be shared by all. There's a difference between the Black Lives Matter movement, the concept toward equality for all, rather than perhaps the Black Lives Matter organization itself. I just ask you for one moment that you walk with me and see it through my eyes. I like to add that some may have different views than myself as we are all not monolithic, but we can unify, attack the issue and stand for equality, not attack each other. That blacks and other people of color have faced in this country. During Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we don't respond all cancers matter because we want to bring focus specifically to breast cancer. One myth that holds true is that the movement hates police officers. I am so sorry, but this isn't true. The Black Lives Matter movement is not about retaliating or eliminating police. Rather, it's about examining the structure of law enforcement and how it can better serve communities, especially black and brown ones. Police officers are people too, and their lives have inherent value. It's not an anti-people movement, therefore it's not an anti-police officer movement. Most police officers are just everyday people who want to do their job, come home safely at the end of their shift. Thus, the Black Lives Matter movement is not trying to make the world more unsafe for police officers. It hopes to make police officers less of a threat to communities of color and people of color. 93% of anti-racial protests have been peace peaceful. Violence is the thing we are protesting against. The actions of a few outliers do not represent the majority. With this all being said, I hope and pray that you have a better understanding why we are reaching for equality. In America, we all have dark pasts and we'd rather not talk about it, but we know now more than ever that it's important that we learn to talk about it. Although we come from different backgrounds, we can be united for the cause of equality and justice. Greetings, I am Bishop Cynthia Moore Kukoi, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Episcopal leader for the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Friends, my name is Dawn Hand, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of serving as the Pittsburgh District Superintendent. I too live in this Cranberry Township area, and wonderful opportunity to have this conversation. We have approximately 700 churches, over a thousand clergy people, throughout all of Western Pennsylvania. And we are headquartered, our conference office is right here in Cranberry Township. What's the state of affairs around race in, in our churches? Do they have an understanding and an awareness of, of racism? Are they tolerant? Are they trying to be more proactive? What are the, what's the state of affairs in the Cranberry That's area? That's a good question. Uh, so we have a church here in uh, Cranberry, Dutail United Methodist Church, wonderful church there. Even as we speak, they are expanding their reach and thrust through a capital campaign and the physical space of their building. Uh, there are large, a, a huge swath of folk that have been very gracious. Um, I would also use the word tolerant, I though, although I know some people want to move toward from tolerance towards acceptance. My point is you got to start somewhere. Right. You got to right. start somewhere. So we right. need to offer some grace at some periods when we see that people are trying to progress. I've been really grateful to God for the work of some of our churches, truly. Um, I would like to think that throughout these past several months that people are earnestly trying to stretch the capacity of their heart to understand mm -hmm. and to have a more sense of welcome and invitation when it comes to one, having conversations about race, but number two, listening yes. to people yes. who are in the black and brown communities, yes. just listening. 
Bishop Cynthia, I often remark that I don't know what people think the heaven of God is going to look like. Mm. I don't think there's going to be a place where it's going to be black folk are here and white folk are here and Jewish folk are here and, and other uh, ethnicities and religious um, affiliations and expressions. I think we model the kingdom of God right here on this earth. and. I, I often say to pastors also, you may not be in an area where there is diversity, but should a person come to the church, they should feel and be welcomed here. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what their ethnicity is, they should feel the presence of God here and to be welcomed in this space. And, and may it be so. So I think that that's one thing we can do is just to be very deliberate about engaging in fellowship mm -hmm. in conversation with folks that don't look like us. Absolutely. That can help to, to move us closer to where we need to be. Um, I grew up in a small town in Kentucky. It was a very white town, like most of Kentucky. As a high schooler, I was just happy to have a unique opportunity to take some classes while I was still uh, in high school. I didn't know much about the college. It was called Kentucky State. And as people started coming in, I slowly realized that I was the only white person in the whole room, and the room was full. It was a moment that I felt just a little uncomfortable for a second, and I looked around and tried to gauge the situation, and then I just felt like this little voice inside me that said, this is what your black neighbors and your black schoolmates feel like every day at church at the grocery store, at school. And that was a very formative moment for me. And I'm really grateful that I had it at a young age. It's not black people's fault there's racism in the world. It's a white person problem. We created this. It's our job to fix it. We shouldn't look to the black community to lead this charge. We should respect and be mindful of their preferences, but this is our problem to fix. We have the privilege, we have the responsibility, we have the power to say enough is enough. Hello. Today we are in the forefront of talking about where Cranberry Township has been, where it is today, and where it's going tomorrow we can talk about where we've come from and how that natural progression has made us a different community. How that natural progression has allowed us to see that we are prepared to continue with the movement, not changing Cranberry into something that someone else wants, but changing Cranberry into the community that allows us to see that we are a community that is welcome, a community that has grown, a community that has shown that we do recognize that things have come full circle. And in America, one of the things that we, we look around and we have to recognize that there are times when change is necessary, there are times when change is demanded, but most of all, there are times when change is welcomed. So one of the things that we are looking to do now is say, where do we go tomorrow? We cannot rest on where we've come from. We know that there are incidents that have happened in the past, uh, some I've experienced, some my family have experienced. We know we've had incidents. We also know that we have been open to discuss those incidents, deal with those incidents. Now we want to say, do we live in a community that says we're ready to do something else? And that's the good thing. Our community now is saying we are the place that wants to move forward. And we are. Thank you. Rural of the Cranberry Area Diversity Network, which is supported by our Board of Supervisors, is to be the vehicle and the mechanism to have meaningful discussion to talk about the barriers that this community may face when it comes to d diversity as well as inclusion. We should never be afraid 
or hesitant to talk about the, those issues, but in the manner that is non-confrontational, but get to the core of the, the, the topic that we're addressing, which is diversity and inclusion. So in, in conclusion, I'd like to say, please work closely with our Cranberry Air Diversity Network. It is the, the official vehicle of, of Cranberry Township to accomplish the goal that I stated that is incorporated and adopted by our Board of Supervisors in the Cranberry Plan. Thank you for your time and thank you for your leadership and support of the Cranberry Area Diversity Network.